Hello, welcome to Neobiotech International Virtual Seminar. Thank you for sharing your moment with us, and I will. I wish everyone is healthy and safe. My name is Chi Hun Shen, a host for tonight's session. Weekly online seminar from Neobiotech will be as you see on the screen. For any inquiry, please contact your local sales representatives for details and registration. Next two lectures on 16th and 23rd will especially deal about the new concept of 3D guide surgical system by Dr. Park from US. As a lecturer, Dr. Ricardo Arves from Portugal will speak about current approaches for peri-implantitis treatment for an hour and share his experience and knowledge. Please use chat button to communicate with me about any issues other than the topic. We'll have Q&A session after the lecture, so please submit your questions through Q&A button. Speaker may not answer for all questions because we have limited time to take all the questions. If you have more questions or anything for discussion, you can contact Neobiotech website, Facebook page, or by email address. Okay, now let's have Dr. Alves to start. Please welcome Dr. Alves. Hello, doctor. How are you there? You have to... Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good night for those who are watching in Portugal. Thank you very much, Neobiotech, for this kind invitation. It is a great honor to be here with you today. Thank you all for watching this webinar. I have a lot of friends here today. So we are going to talk about peri-implantitis today, and we will focus more on surgical approaches, and you will soon know why. Peri-implantitis, one of the biggest nightmares of the implantologist. So for those who don't know me, I will do a brief presentation, no more than 30 seconds. My name is Ricardo Walsh. I came from Lisbon, Portugal. Um, I'm a periodontist. I divide my week between the university and private practice. I hope that soon we'll, we'll, uh, we'll overcome this pandemic of COVID-19 and that you can visit this sunny and lov lovely city of Lisbon. Uh, this is my university, Eges Muniz. It's just across the other side of the river. Um, I am the head of the Perio. Um, this is part of, of my team with some of our postgraduate students. Uh, we will be delighted to receive you if you want. The university is just five minutes away from Costa de Caparica with this 30 kilometer sand beach. So another motive to visit us. So going back to our team today, um, why uh, a webinar about peri-implantitis? Well, each year, more than 5 million implants are placed. Implants have a high success rate, about 90 to 95% survival rate, but uh, that number does not account for the biological problems that we can have. And the prevalence of peri-implantitis at patient level ranges from 10 to 47 percent. An average number, uh, it's 22 percent, what means that one in five patients coming to our clinic will have peri-implantitis. And probably this number might be increasing uh, because the number of implants placed every, every year is increasing, but also because we have less experienced professionals placing implants. And as you know, um, a poor surgical technique, improper 
uh, implant placement can be associated with peri-implantitis. The, sever the severity of peri-implantitis uh, is negatively correlated with success of treatment. So we must do uh, an early diagnosis and an effective treatment. The number of articles published in the last 10 years um, uh, gives an idea of the growing interest in this topic. I think for all of those that are watching, there is an interest in the, the, the periplantitis subject, but for some patients and even for some colleagues, they underestimate the problem of periimplantitis. Periimplantitis can have very serious consequences, as uh, described in this case report that was recently published. This patient had an implant here in the maxilla with an advanced periimplantitis lesion that was causing an, a, a sinusitis of the maxillary sinus, but also on the frontal sinus. Patient presented a severe headache and a progressive aphasia, so was admitted to the hospital. At the hospital, they did a CT that revealed this massive brain abscess. On the, the ICU, they tried to remove the implant, but the implant was displaced into the maxillary sinus, so the EMT surgeon had to perform a sinus surgery to remove the implant. Um, the patient was on IV antibiotics and there was a need to perform a craniotomy to drain this huge abscess, but unfortunately the patient never fully recovered and uh, passed away a few times uh, a few, uh, uh, few time after. So uh, as you can see in these cases of sinusitis, it's uh, mandatory, uh, an immediate and aggressive treatment. And when we have this type of situations, there is indication for prompt implant removal. So there, there are a few questions, very important from a clinical point of view, like uh, is non-surgical treatment effective? What about surgical treatment? Which, which techniques do we have? Uh, which one to choose, uh, what's the best decontamination protocol, do we need or not to perform imp implantoplasty, in the regenerative treatment, what is the best material, is an, any material that is better, and about soft tissue augmentation, should we perform it, uh, in which cases, and very important, we need to know if the results of the treatment are stable, over time. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, clear guidelines for peri-implantitis treatment, but I will try to summarize the best evidence available. The diagnosis is very, very important. And uh, just let me do a brief introduction to peri-implant diseases. Peri-implant diseases are mainly caused by plague biofilm that produces an inflammation around the implant. When we have an inflammation of the soft tissues only, that condition is caused, it's called mucositis. Mucositis is the analogous to gingivitis. It's reversible. We don't have bone loss, but um, uh, mucositis uh, can progress to peri-implantitis. In peri-implantitis, beside the inflammation and the increased probing depth, we have bone loss. And that's the uh, main char characteristic of peri-implantitis. It is the presence of bone loss. It is very important, uh, the question of the case definition. Uh, we should all speak the same language and the last classification from EFP and AAP made it very clear. Um, unfortunately for peri-implantitis, we don't have a value uh, uh, that we can say that is health 
and a value that we can say that it's disease, unlike periodontal disease, um, because we have different implant systems, different types of connection. Implants can be placed tissue level, bone level. We can have different depth, uh, different uh, widths of uh, soft tissue. So it is essential after placing the crown on the implant to probe and to register, register that value because it will function as our baseline for future comparisons. It is also very important to take an X-ray with an X-ray film holder to compare over the time if we have bone loss. So we can consider that we have a periimplantitis when PD is increasing comparing with baseline and when we have bone loss uh, beyond the natural or the physiological remodeling after placing the crown together with inflammatory signs, bleeding or superation. But uh, in some cases, patient comes from another clinic and we don't have uh, previous data to compare. So in that cases, we consider that the patient has a periimplantitis if the bone level is more than three millimeters apical to the most coronal portion of the implant, if the probing depth is more than six millimeters, and we, if we have bleeding or separation on gentle probing. The radiographic diagnosis it's important, but has some limitations. Conventional radiographs have a low sensitivity. We need a great amount of destruction before we can see it on the X-ray. And on the, on the X-ray, we can only assess the bone level on distal and on mesial, not on the vestibular or the lingual. And Conventional X-rays uh, doesn't allow us to uh, understand the anatomy of the bone defects. CBCT, although this doesn't make, make part of the initial diagnosis, it's a very important tool in planning regenerative surgery and in the process of decision, decision making. But these methods only show us past destruction. So uh, nowadays, we have uh, intense investigation, intense research about my biomarkers, uh, salivary biomarkers and trabecular fluid biomarkers that could be used as an early diagnosis tool and also for treatment monitoring over time. Let me show you this case uh, about the importance of a good diagnosis. In this case, the, the patient had two implants on the maxilla. He complained about bad taste, uh, bleeding, uh, and some pain. When we remove the implants, we can see uh, the redness, the edema, and we have an increased probing depth. And on the x-ray, we can see that there is a vertical bone defect on the most anterior implant. The question for you is, can we, and in this case, predictably regenerate this defect? Notice that the bone peak is here, the defect is here. Can we put here some biomaterial membrane and uh, regenerate predictably this bone defect? Well, when el we elevated the flap, it was this the situation that we found. The distal implant had a major fat fracture of the platform and the anterior one had this crack. Here it is quite uh, obvious, but there are some situations when we only have a very small and thin crack that are not visible on the X-ray, are not visible when we remove the crowns. And it happened to me had all the stuff prepared to do a regeneration. And sometime after, I noticed that the implant had a fracture. So in this case, it is obvious impossible, and we need to remove those implants. 
the, the etiology of perimplantitis is multifactorial. Poor oral hygiene and lack of maintenance are important and the major risk factors for perimplantitis. A previous history of periodontitis is also an important risk factor, uh, particularly active or non-treated periodontitis. And what was formerly known as aggressive periodontitis is hi highly associated with the risk of peri-implantitis. Smoking is also an important risk factor. Smokers have twice uh, uh, a failure rate. Are you seeing my screen? It went out. Yes, your screen is off. No, sorry. So I was telling, smoking, smoking is an important risk factor. Also, some systemic diseases like diabetes with poor uh, metabolic control are also uh, important. But as you can see, the color is fading because also the evidence that we have from the studies um, it's not so strong for some of these factors. Some of them would be better called risk indicators and not risk factors because the evidence is mainly from cross-sectional studies and not from longitudinal studies. Uh, unlike periodontal disease that is more generalized, uh, periimplantitis seems to be a site-specific condition where local factors can play an important role. There are several uh, local situations that can increase the risk of periimplantitis or provoke periimplantitis, like the excess of cement. In 80% of the cases where we have excess of cement, we, we will have uh, periimplantitis because cement has a rough surface that retains bacteria. So, in the majority of cases, uh, I prefer screw retain uh, prosthesis. Surgical factors are also important. Uh, overheating, excess, excessive torque, uh, implant malposition, malpositioning, for example, an implant that is too bu buccally, can cause bone loss. If we have a thin biotype, uh, soon we will have a recession and it's a matter of time before that area will be invaded by bacteria and we'll have a peri-implantitis. Prosthetic factors and prosthetic design is also very important. Misfit, convexities, uh, marked emergency profile can have a paper in plaque retention and on peri-implantitis onset. About occlusal loads, what we know at, is that excessive forces by itself don't cause uh, peri-implantitis. Uh, once the inflammation uh, is set, they can eventually aggravate the situation, but uh, forces by itself don't provoke peri-implantitis. What provokes peri-implantitis are bacteria. But it's very important to distinguish between precipitating um, uh, factors, uh, accelerating factors, uh, and uh, what, what we could call um, causal factors. Sorry, something wrong here. Precipitating factors are factors that are, are capable of causing the disease, also called causal factors. Predisponent factors are factors that by themselves do not cause the disease, but when they are present, they increase the risk of disease. Accelerating factors are factors that actuate after the disease is present and they alter the rate of progression. It's very important to deliver the, the patient with a prosthesis with adequate contours that it is easy to clean without retentive areas, as we see in this case, and it's mandatory um, regular maintenance 
um, patients need to be educated, need to be trained. Um, it's not just a question of placing the implants. A patient that has lost the, the teeth because of poor oral hygiene, naturally will continue to experience some difficulties. So it's our job, it's our mission to train that patient to explain how the maintenance is important for the long-term results and for the prevention of perimplantitis. Another controversial issue is the, the role of implant surface treatment on perimplantitis. Um, uh, some authors say that rough implants retain more plaque, so the rate of progression in rough implants is greater than on machine implants, but we have controversial data. Some studies say that moderately rough implants um, uh, present the same rate of perimplantitis that machine implants, and those moderately rough implants are the majority of implants that are placed today. So we need more studies about this question of surface treatment and perimplantitis. We need to do to to know to do to know more about uh, uh, the impact of the surface treatment on the outcomes of both uh, non-surgical and surgical treatment. Currently, we are undertaking some studies at our university about uh, implant surface treatment and um, uh, bacterial colonization, and also testing some methods for biofilm removal. <coughs> so, uh, Perimplantitis progresses in a non-linear accelerated pattern. Perimplantitis has a faster progression than periodontitis. And there are several reasons for that. Um, in implants, we don't have periodontal ligaments, so we have less vascularization. Uh, the fibers, the connective tissue fibers are parallel to the implants. In teeth, the connective tissue fibers are perpendicular to the implants. So we have less resistance to the infection. We have a stronger inflammatory response and the inflammation is not encapsulated by connective tissue and we have a bone infection in perimplantitis. Uh, the infection can, re can reach uh, the bone marrow. So from my point of view, I, I prefer 100 times to treat a, a patient with a periodontitis than to treat um, a perimplantitis patient. It's much easier to, to treat a, a periodontitis. The, the old uh, literature only reported survival rates, but survival, it's very different from success. As you can see from this case of this 22-year-old girl that has 100% uh, survival because implants are still there, are still in place, are still in function. But this case, it's a case of 0% of success. As you can see, there is recession, there is inflammation, bleeding. This problem might be, have been caused by this cement excess, inadequate implant positioning. And we also see some biomaterial here. Uh, probably there were some problems with GBR. We notice here that this implant is going the same way. We don't have enough volume on the vestibular. So between success and failure, we can have uh, a lot of things in between. So Carl, Lim Carl Misch proposed this PISA implant health scale um, where he considers four categories, success that corresponds to optimum health, where we don't have pain, no mobility, and the bone loss is less than two millimeters to account for the initial bone remodeling. There is also no separation. In that case, we don't need any intervention. We have another category that is satisfactory survival. This means that 
things are not 100% are not perfect but we don't have pain we don't have mobility and we have a mild bone loss of two to four millimeters and we don't have infection so indicate in this case there is all there is there is no need for intervention too the third situation is the compromised survival. In this case, patient may have sensitivity, we don't have mobility, but, but the bone loss is more than four millimeters and uh, the probing depth is more than seven millimeters and it uh, may have an exudate history. In this case, we, we, we will need surgical treatment. Failure is when the patient, the patient has a, an implant that is mobile with pain or with a bone loss that is more than 50% of the implant length. Okay. Let's talk now a little bit of treat, treatment planning. Uh, I know that this first part is a little bit hard, but it is very important. But soon I will show some clinical cases, I promise you. Uh, normally, in the periimplantitis treatment, we follow the same sequence that we use for periodontitis treatment. We start by a pre-treatment phase where we try to control the systemic risk factors, smoking, uncontrolled diabetes. We give the patient oral hygiene instructions, motivation, and then uh, we perform non-surgical treatment with or without adjuvants such as uh, antibiotics, antiseptics, and that will work in uh, mucositis, that will work in the initial perimplantitis cases, but in moderate to advanced perimplantitis lesions, non-surgical treatment is ineffective, okay? So that's why uh, I um, concentrated this webinar mainly on surgical treatment because in moderate to advanced peri-implantitis cases we need to perform surgery we should not delay surgery because as the situation gets worse the prognosis will all uh, also uh, deteriorate but the question here is is uh, can we skip this step since uh, non-surgical uh, non treatment is ineffective in reducing probing depth in severe perimplantitis cases? The answer is no. No, because we need uh, time to train the patient, time to evaluate uh, what the patient is capable of, and because we need to uh, get some disinflammation of the tissues before surgery. The severity of the periimplantitis is very important for the final prognosis. Um, this classification from Stuart Froome, uh, it's very good. It's the classification I use in my practice that um, classifies periimplant lesions in three categories: mild moderate and severe. In a mild periimplantitis, the probing depth is more than four millimeters and the bone loss is less than 25% of implant length. On moderate periimplantitis, probing depth is more than six millimeters and bone loss is between 25 to 50% of implant length. In severe periimplantitis, the bone loss is more than eight millimeters and the bone loss is more than 50% of the implant length. On all of them, we can have bleeding and we can have exudate. Before starting a treatment, uh, we must find what is the prognosis. And in periodontology, we have several prognosis systems where, can, where we can assign a prognosis for a, an individual tooth. And in the periimplantitis lesions, we can also do the same. This prognosis system from, proposed by Decker 
um, contains four categories, favorable, questionable, and favorable, and hopeless. On the favorable prognosis, we only need surgical treatment and the success is likely. On questionable and unfavorable, we will need surgical treatment, but the difference is that in the questionable prognosis, the success is probable, and on the unfavorable, the success is unlikely. Hopeless, prog uh, hopeless prognosis, the treatment is implant removal. So, the, favor the favorable prognosis corresponds to the case of mucositis and also to early peri-implantitis and the questionable prognosis corresponds to moderate uh, peri-implantitis cases where uh, unfavorable and hopeless correspond to advanced peri-implantitis lesions. In the treatment of peri-implantitis, as I told you, we start with non-surgical uh, approaches. Uh, we use mechanical instrumentation for biofilm removal that can be complemented with lasers, with systemic or topic antibiotics, and with antiseptics. That will work in mucositis, in initial periempentitis lesions, but in more advanced cases, we need a surgical approach that might consist of an access surgery where we open, <coughs> sorry, we open, clean, and close. Uh, we do that uh, mainly on the aesthetic area where we try to be more conservative. On the posterior sectors, um, many times when we have a horizontal bone loss, we, pref we perform a resective surgery where we eliminate uh, mucosa and or bone. On the situations where we have uh, favorable anatomy, we can try to regenerate. And in situations that the implant is mobile or that do not respond to the previous treatments, we have to remove the implant. But don't forget this part, it is very important irrespective of the treatment, it is fundamental, uh, a good plague control by the patient because otherwise uh, any treatment won't work. In the treatment selection, there are several factors that we must consider. The first one is uh, the 3D implant position. We must assess if the implant is in the correct position or not. If it's not, it's better to remove the implant and start again, because in most of the cases, we, we will always have some problems with that implant. We have to establish an implant prognosis that depends on the level of bone loss. We have, the, we have to assess the strate strategic value of that implant and the possibility of prosthesis reconditioning, because sometimes, when we have a full arch restoration with several implants where all the implants are okay and we have only one implant with peri-implantitis, we can remove that implant without altering the prognosis of the global treatment. Play control, as, as I told you, it's a, a very, very, very important uh, factor. We don't make surgery uh, to patients if they do not brush, don't have an excellent, an excellent compliance, an, ex, uh, an excellent level of oral hygiene. Defect morphology is also very important. We must decide if we go through a resective or regenerative approach, and that is dictated by bone anatomy. Also, the, pre the presence of systemic risk factors we have to know if the patient has any disease that contraindicates a surgical treatment, for example, uh, radio, uh, radiotherapy uh, um, and other um, 
systemic diseases that contraindicate a surgical intervention. Um, we have to see if the, the problem is in the aesthetic or on non-static area. In the static area, we always try to be more conservative. We have to assess the soft tissues to see if we need also to improve the, the soft tissue condition. And obvious, we must consider patient expectations and profile uh, because some of these, these patients have, have uh, gone through a long treatment, spend a lot of money, and sometimes it's not easy to manage that situation. Patients uh, are frustrated, are tired, uh, so that part is not easy. So uh, surface decontamination seems to be one of the most critical steps uh, to achieve the success in the treatment of peri-implantitis. In a contaminated uh, surface, can we um, make this surface biocompatible again? Um, we are, these uh, photos of SEM are from one study that we are making at our university where we are assessing uh, bacterial colonization of different uh, uh, surfaces. Um, we are also researching about the contamination methods. In, practi in practice, uh, for decontaminating an implant surface, we can have physical and chemical methods. On physical methods, we can use curettes, we can use ultrasounds, we can use uh, air powder devices, titanium brushes, and lasers. For chemical decontamination, we can use saline, hydrogen peroxide, uh, citric acid, uh, phosphoric acid, EDTA, uh, chlorhexidine, uh, topical antibiotics. So we have a lot of stuff that we can use for chemical de uh, decontamination. And we will talk later about what's the best one. But it seems that uh, the best combination to achieve a proper decontamination is the combination of the two methods. Um, you know that we can use uh, conventional stainless steel curettes on implant surfaces because uh, um, that could damage the titanium oxide uh, um, coat. So for implants, we use plastic or carbon curettes, but these curettes are very fragile. They are not very effective. They are easy to, to, to work. So I prefer titanium curettes that are stronger, um, that they are more effective, removing granulation tissue. But whatever the type of curette that you use, um, you will ne never be able to clean between the threads. Plastic and carbon cu uh, curettes also have another problem. They are very soft and can leave some plastic residu residues on the implant surface. Air powder devices uh, are very useful to clean uh, those more inaccessible areas. There are some recent devices in the market like this Perioflow from EMS that it has this uh, plastic piece, this plastic nose that can reach up to nine millimeter pockets. Um, it is used in conjunction with this erythritol powder that has a small diameter of particle. Um, it is safe for implant surface and because it is so small, it is also very, uh, very easy to clean and this this could be a, a good alternative to clean between the threads and to complete the the process of biofilm removal the this um, uh, air powder device can be utilized in both a non-surgical and surgical treatment the conventional powder or sodium bicarbonate um, 
is very abrasive and should not be used on implant surfaces. Another option for uh, physical decontamination are titanium brushes. Neobiotech has two types of brushes, the R brush and the I brush. The R brush, uh, it hugs the, the implant. We leave it working one minute per, per thread and we are cleaning and at the same time creating a new surface. But it has one problem, when we have a very narrow and deep defect, this part stops here on the bone and we are unable to clean the, the most, most uh, uh, apical part of the defect. In that cases, we can use the smaller eye brush that can also be utilized uh, in non-surgical treatment. And some studies uh, demonstrate good results with uh, titanium brushes used on the perimplantitis treatment. And what about uh, chemical decontamination? Uh, what what uh, products should we select? Well, most uh, of the evidence we have comes from in vitro studies, and some of these studies do not use uh, uh, implants, as you know, they use uh, titanium discs that is different, um, and so the results uh, cannot be uh, reproduced to clinical practice. And in the majority of studies, they use um, several uh, substances and antimicrobials at the same time. So it's uh, difficult to draw a conclusion. So what we know at, at, uh, at nowadays, that there is no data to say that A, it's better than B. Um, one interesting thing is that in some studies, saline solution perform equally well than Florexidin and other products. Um, in one study, they rinse with uh, several antiseptic solutions with saline, and in one group, they rinse it twice with saline, a double rinse group. In that double rinse uh, group with saline, the result was better. And that may be due to the flushing effect, due, due to a physical effect of removing the bacteria and not to an antibacterial effect. What about lasers? Well, uh, lasers um, have uh, interesting properties. The, they are using tissue debridement. They can inactivate bacteria. Some lasers are also able to remove our tissues, so they can remove calculus have uh, um, an hemostatic and photobiomodulation properties, but not all lasers can be utilized over implants. Those that you see in green are safe. They do not damage implant surface, but those in red are contraindicated because they can damage the implant surface. It's very important to control the power to avoid overheating uh, because it can cause uh, bone necrosis and other complications. And what about the results? The majority of the studies that we have evaluate lasers as an adjunct to surgical or non-surgical treatment. We don't have much studies that evaluate lasers as monotherapy. And we only have uh, evidence for erbium laser, carbon dioxide laser, and diode lasers. And what the studies say is that at the short term, we have uh, a minimal benefit in PD reduction. We, we also have uh, a reduction in bleeding on probing in the short term. But the question here is uh, different from 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters are uh, significant from a clinical point of view 
since the the cost of these um, devices is very expensive let's now uh, talk about uh, surgical approaches and we'll start by resective surgery as i told you before in uh, resective surgery we eliminate some mucosa in some cases we also eliminate some bone the objective of the surgery is to reduce the peri-implant pocket uh, beside getting a direct access to the implant surface for the, uh, the decontamination and by doing that bone remodeling and uh, uh, soft tissue remodeling we cre can create access to the patient to perform uh, proper oral hygiene but as you can see these techniques are associated with a higher degree of recessions in some cases the patient at the end of the surgery will see some metal so so they are mainly indicated when we have an horizontal bone loss and on the posterior regions what about the results of these techniques what we find in the literature well uh, resective surgery is effective in reducing probing depth, but it is important for you to know that it's not very easy to achieve long-term long success. In this study from Sereno, only 50% of the patients treated with resective surgery presented no signs of peri-implantitis following two years. So, one of the problems of peri-implantitis uh, uh, is the problem of the relapse. Um, the prognosis seems to be dependent on the initial bone loss. So that's why it's so important uh, prompt uh, rapid diagnosis, uh, an aggressive treatment. We <clears throat> must not hesitate in performing the surgery. What about implantoplasty? Removing the threads with burrs, yes or not? Uh, it's another controversial issue. When, when we remove the threads and try to polish the implant surfaces, it's easier to the patient to clean. Uh, we see less plague accumulation in these areas. And also for us as professionals, it's easier to re-instrument that areas in the maintenance visits. But there are also some concerns uh, in performing that type of procedure. One of them is temperature increase. We also have the risk of perforation of the implant body, of damaging the implant connection, the problem of titanium particles and mucosal staining, and in this case, the patient presented two implants here in the maxilla. As you can see, implants are, are placed at, at different levels. The most anterior one has an horizontal bone loss. And this patient refused to remove this implant. So in this case, what we have done was to perform an implantoplasty. It was like uh, transforming this uh, bone level implant in a tissue level implant. And then after polishing, we try to, to get as smooth as possible, but it's never very, very, very smooth, but it's acceptable from a clinical point of view. And then we uh, epically position the flap. Uh, let's try to answer now to the, the questions uh, I've placed before about the risks of implantoplasty. Uh, although technically demanding and time consuming uh, for standard diameter external eggs implants, um, it seems that implantoplasty doesn't alter fracture resistance. But we need to be more, uh, we must proceed with more caution in narrow implants or in 
freestanding implants or implants in the posterior regions. In that cases, there is an increased risk of fracture. About the temperature rise, studies de demonstrate that with uh, proper cooling, um, the temperature rise is not very significant and there is no risk of bone necrosis. Um, so, um, in this uh, systematic review from Andreas Slavopoulos, um, the author, says, the author state, uh, states that implantoplasty seems not to be associated with any remarkable mechanical or biological complications. So I think it's a, a, a question of uh, preference, personal preference of the professional to do or not to do implantoplasty. Um, some studies um, say that the results when we perform implantoplasty are better than, we, than that in situations where we do not perform. Uh, the PD reduction, uh, the bleeding reduction, and also the microbiological results are better in the group of implantoplasty. And that may, uh, might also be important. The risk of re, uh, relapse uh, is uh, lesser in the group where we perform implantoplasty. But uh, other authors, out, out, other authors uh, say that <clears throat> it doesn't matter if you do or not implantoplasty, the result will be the same, and that the final prognosis is mainly dictated by initial marginal bone loss and it seemed independent of the surgical modality. <clears throat> so one concern of implantoplasty um, are these uh, titanium particles, these ma macro particles that are difficult to remove and that can cause mucosal staining. But the main problem, it's not only this. The main problem are titanium nanoparticles, very small particles that can enter uh, and can reach uh, um, systemic uh, circulation. These uh, nanoparticles of titanium can increase the number of, of pro-inflammatory cytokines, can uh, produce uh, alterations on several types of cells, so we need to know more about the possible systemic and local uh, side effects of uh, these titanium particles that can be produced not only by grinding the implant, by making the implantoplasty, but titanium nanoparticles might also be produced as, a res as the result of mechanical wear by micro movements and also by corrosion. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, regenerative or uh, the term I prefer, reconstructive surgery. Um, re integration, a myth or a reality? Well, uh, we have a few studies for ethical reasons. We don't have a lot of studies, but we have a few, a few histological studies in humans that state, it demonstrates that it is possible to achieve direct to bone implant contact in a previously contamined surface. The question is that that um, process of geosteral integration, it's not very predictable. For instance, in situations where we have a bone loss in uh, eight threads, imagine, we only can regenerate the three lower ones. Okay, so it is not 100% predictable. Um, there might be an influence of implant surface on this process. We need to study more about this subject. One of the most important factors on the outcome of regenerative surgery is the anatomy of bone defects. 
we can have an horizontal bone loss, we can have interbone defects, or we can have a combined defect that in the upper part we have horizontal bone loss and on the lower part we have a vertical bone defect. Unfortunately, the majority of defects are the Hissens and 2 to 3 wall defects that are not the best ones to regenerate. The best defects to re regenerate are well contained defects. In these cases, we can perform regenerative surgery when the bone loss is horizontal. The indication is for resective surgery. In these combined effects, the treatment can be a mix. We can perform, for example, implantoplasty of the supra osseous component and regeneration of the interbony defect. We can also classify. Um, the severity of the lesions in advanced, moderate, or slight, according to the depth of the intra bony component. There is only benefit to regenerate defects with more than three millimeters uh, of uh, intra bony component. Let me show. Let me show you now this case. Uh, this patient had two implants in the mandible. Implants are not in the ideal prosthetic position. As you can see, the hole, the screw hole here and here. Uh, that can cause some problems with cleaning. When we remove the bridge, um, we can see some suppuration here. And on the X-ray, we can see interbony defects around the implant. Well, the, the patient refused to, to remove the, the implants and to redo the treatment, placing the implants in the ideal positions. And we decided in this case to try to regenerate these defects. We perform intracircular incisions, open a full thickness flap, remove the granulation tissue, and this is the anatomy of the defect after removing granulation tissue and after cleaning the implant surface with hydrogen peroxide. The depth of the defect uh, is cor correlated with uh, the outcome. Deeper defects appear to have a better uh, uh, potential in terms of regeneration. And the ideal defect uh, to regenerate is this type of defect, a circular defect. Uh, we have a four wall defect that is very contained. We have filled the defect with uh, a sinograft, bovine bone. Don't forget uh, that we, when is, this is very important uh, to have in mind. Uh, when we do this type of surgery, we are not treating the disease. We are treating a sequela of the disease, okay? Um, it's very important not to forget that, and we must address first the question of oral hygiene, um, smoking cessation, the other risk factors, okay? We have placed the, the bone substitute. And in this case, do we need a membrane? Do we need to cover uh, the biomaterial with a membrane in this case? Well, <clears throat> recent data suggests that in a case like this, in a well-contained defect, we don't need a membrane. We can use a connective tissue graft Okay, to protect the biomaterial and at the same time uh, improve the soft tissue characteristics. But uh, in uh, defects with other configuration, uh, two to three wall defects, where it's uh, more difficult to contain the biomaterial in place, uh, it, is, uh, 
it is a good idea to use a membrane. This is all an old case, so we have put a collagen membrane. You see it. And another thing that we do usually is to put the healing abutments before the suture to keep the space. Then we remove the healing abutments and then place the prosthesis uh, back again in place. In this case, uh, I don't know if, if we have a re integration or we only have a defect field. To assess if we have a true regeneration, we need histology. And in clinical practice, we only do clinical examination and radiographs. So it is impossible to guarantee that in this case, we have a, a true regeneration because we have a bone filling, but we, between the bone and the implant, we can have connective tissue. But from my point of view, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if the result is stable. If that uh, uh, bone level is stable of the, over the time, if the probing depth is stable, if we have no bleeding, no separation, that's a, a good result from a, a clinical point of view. That's the motive uh, why I prefer to call it reconstructive and not regenerative surgery, okay? So before uh, uh, starting uh, reconstructive surgery, uh, it is essential the part of the diagnosis to see if it works or not uh, to regenerate. And we must identif identify on the X-ray uh, some landmarks, the crest of the neighboring teeth, identify the position of the platform of the implant, because if everything goes very well, this will be the maximum feeling that we can get. Uh, we need to estimate the depth and the number of walls, the shape of the intrabone defect, and also assess the residual osseointegration, because normally when we have uh, a bone loss that is more than 50% of the implant length, we remove the implant. Another case of uh, a regenerative approach. In, the case, in this case, the prosthesis contour is very bad. It's impossible to the patient to clean uh, under the prosthesis. And when we remove the prosthesis, you see a lot of calculus, a lot of plaque. And you see all the tissue is red, swollen, uh, an increased probing depth. And on the X-ray, um, we can see vertical bone defects around the implants. So what is the best decontamination protocol? I told you we don't have uh, solid evidence to say that that protocol is the best one. This is uh, what we normally do. We combine mechanical and chemical decontamination. Uh, in the first uh, <clears throat> step, with titanium curettes, we remove the granulation tissue from the defect. And then with the uh, air powder or with tie brushes, we clean the implant surface. Then we do a chemical decontamination with a cotton pellet with chlorhexidine and hydrogen peroxide. But in between, we rinse a lot with saline. I see some colleagues that uh, use a large uh, amount of products simultaneously, hoping that something will work. But sometimes what we get is the chemical inactivation of that compounds. So you don't need to use a, a lot of stuff, okay? You just need to spend some time with the substances that are easily accessible to us, hydrogen peroxide and chlorhexidine cleaning around the implant and rinse, rinse, rinse with saline. Uh, after elevating the flap and removing the um, granulation tissue, this is the anatomy of the bone defects. As you can see, we also have a periodontal defect 
on the canine, the eye brush to clean the implant, then fluorexidin, and after that, saline. We fill the defect with the uh, uh, bovine bone, place the collagen membrane, and close. Uh, usually, when we place a biomaterial, we give antibiotics. Uh, we need more studies to assess the real need uh, in this case, but in the ma majority of uh, clinical trials, authors also utilize antibiotics. And as you can see in, the, in this picture, uh, we have cut this prosthesis here to ensure that the patient is able to clean underneath. This was an acrylic prosthesis, so what see, it, it was easy to cut. Now on the x-ray, and I'm sorry for the quality of the, this uh, x-ray, we can see that there is a bone filling of the defect. Now we just have to wait some time to see if it's stable, and after that, uh, to redo uh, a prosthesis. We have to make a new prosthesis. So what to expect um, from re reconstructive, or, <clears throat> or, sorry, or regenerative surgery? Well, this type of treatment can uh, result in improved clinical and radiographic outcomes that can be <clears throat> sometimes be stable at long term. There is no evidence to support uh, a specific biomaterial, okay? I don't know if uh, an allograft is better than a sinograft. We don't have uh, <clears throat> that data. But uh, very important information is that despite the successful clinical and radiographic clinical uh, <clears throat> uh, outcomes, um, in uh, a good uh, percentage of cases, we still um, um, can see disease uh, progression, recurrence, and implant loss. So it's not so easy as it seems it's not just open, clean, put the biomaterial in, it's done, and that will work 100% of the cases. It's not like that. The problems can come from uh, incomplete decontamination, from membrane exposure to systemic risk factors of the patient. So um, we need to, at the end of the treatment, and uh, after, after the end of the healing process, we must evaluate if we have stability or progression of the disease. Um, in a case of stability, that's what we want, the probing depth is less than six, uh, five millimeters and the bone level is stable or increased. And we have uh, absence of inflammatory signs or separation, okay? But the treatment doesn't stop here at the, su the surgical treatment. The supportive treatment, the maintenance visits are very important to man maintain the results over the long term, okay? Now we go to the last option. Implant removal. Well, when we have uh, uh, an implant that is mobile, we don't have another option. When the previous treatments failed, we also don't have another option. But we have situations that need to be assessed carefully. When we have implants that are placed in a compromised situation, implants too close to each other, implants too close to one teeth, implants that are placed too vocally, in that cases, we should remove the implant, regenerate and start over again. Let me show you this case. Um, 
this patient had three implants here on the mandible. As you can see, the soft tissue quality is not very good. We have inflammation, bleeding, suppuration, increases probing that. And when we have splinted crowns, uh, it's very important to try to remove the crowns to assess each implant individually. And when we remove uh, this bridge, one implant came attached. And we can see that we have an horizontal bone loss on the distal implant. And we, who, uh, we have a huge defect. Uh, the length of the implant is the length of the, 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 the defect. So I can put a finger inside. Um, in this case, we did not perform implantoplasty on the distal implant. We just cleaned. And then we regenerated the, the bone defect with the sinograft and the collagen membrane. Um, one question um, that uh, you could uh, ask is, is it better submerge or non-submerge healing? Well, um, submerged healing could be better because the chance of contamination uh, is lower. But we don't have uh, enough studies to prove that one option is better than the other. And in some cases, we are unable to remove the prosthesis in the case of cemented prosthesis. And also on the aesthetic area, the patient won't uh, uh, won't permit uh, to go home without the, the prosthesis, okay? So this is the, the final outcome of this case. The crowns were redone, redone. Two implants are sufficient for, to support this bridge. Without any soft tissue graft, the uh, soft tissue condition is better. We don't have bleeding. And on the, after two years, you can see on the radiograph that we have a complete feeling of this bone defect that was here in the middle implant at that, and that the bone level on the distal implant is stable. And now with only two implants, it's much easier for the patient to clean than on the situation where she had an implant in the middle. Remind that this, this was the initial situation. The, the tissues were in pretty bad shape. So can it get worse? Yes, it can in some cases. Uh, that's why we shouldn't uh, treat these cases uh, as soon as possible. Um, this is the initial situation when the patient came, came to me. Um, uh, he was very unhappy with uh, the other dentist that extracted the, the lateral incisors that had large periapical lesions. But as you can see, uh, there was uh, no GBR here and we have a collapse but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk to you about uh, the situation on the mandible. There was an implant here that was removed, not by the first dentist, but by a second colleague. And he removed the implant, but no attempt to regenerate uh, this area has been done. So uh, this is the bone defect that we have. As you can see, we have a vertical bone defect in this area. It is impossible to place an implant back again here. This was the initial situation. I got this x-ray from the previous dentist. I understand the reasons to remove this implant from a restorative and orthodontic point of view, but this one is more debatable since the bone loss, it's not so severe, but he decided to remove. And 
I think that the process of the removal, it's not always to, it, it's not always easy to remove implants on the mandible. Uh, I think that in this case, uh, he utilized burst because I see some uh, um, titanium particles. But on the CBCT, you can see that there is a huge bone loss and we have uh, in some areas a distance of four millimeters to mental nerve. So we, in this case, we decided to regenerate this bone defect with a mix of 50-50 of autologous bone and sinograft and with a, a reinforced PTFE membrane. The autologous bone was uh, collected with this safe scraper, the suture, the healing, and this is the... Um, the radiographic image after 11 months. We also performed a, re a regeneration here, here, and here. Um, keep this in mind, and I think this happens with all types of, of treatments. Every time we redo a treatment, the chance of success decreases. If it is the sec second attempt, um, it uh, goes down a little bit, if it, if it is a third attempt, it goes, it goes down even more. But this is the healing. This is the situation uh, of the patient when I send him uh, back again to the referring doctor. For me, the best method to remove implants is the reverse torque. Uh, there are several kits on the market from me, and it's not publicity. It's... Uh, my true opinion. This one from Neobiotech is one of the best and it works very well, but we can only use it when we have an intact connection. If we have uh, an implant that is fractured for the middle, it won't work. And in one body implants, it won't work either. So in that cases, we can do <clears throat> We can use uh, piezo surgery to try to be a traumatic. Uh, Trefines and burrs are very aggressive methods to remove the implants, and as you seen in the case before, can lead to a huge bone loss. Let me show you another case. Uh, <clears throat> this case, uh, I could call you uh, a pan periimplantitis because all the implants in her mouth have periimplantitis. Uh, we know that uh, a cluster of patients is responsible for a high number of cases of periimplantitis. And that demonstrates the, um, the importance of the genetic factors on periimplantitis. In this case, the, the motive of concern was number 36. Here, this implant uh, had an advanced bone loss, more than 50%. And this X-ray was taken by other colleague that decided to extract the implant, but uh, didn't attempt to regenerate the defect. So we have this, situ this situation, uh, vertical bone loss on the posterior maxilla, as you can see, there is a vertical and horizontal defect, and we are very near from the mental nerve. And here, we did the same as on the previous case, a 50-50 mix of autologous bone and sinograft. Neobiotech has this burr that is very useful to collect autologous bone. Normally, I collect it from the ramus, retro, the, the retromolar area. And we utilize this EPTFA membrane. The membrane is stabilized with titanium pins. And the suture is very important. We have to assure a passive closure. So the suture is in two layers. The first one to approximate the, the flaps and the second it's to close. This is a 4-0 PTFS suture. 
and this this is the control x-ray you can see the titanium reinforcement of the membrane and the tax but one complication that uh, it's frequent with this type of membranes is membrane exposure as you can see here on the dis distal aspect of the premolar we have a membrane exposure we can try to leave it uh, for some time applying chlorhexidine gel antibiotics but if the patient has pain or infection we will have to remove uh, in this case, the, expo the, uh, the exposition of the membrane uh, was a late uh, exposure. Um, it was about two months after the surgery. Uh, we tried to keep it a little bit, but it was increasing in size. So we decided to remove the membrane and after removing the membrane oh, sorry doesn't appear this slide so this slide doesn't want to show up so but i can tell you after removing the membrane uh, the graft was consistent and uh, it didn't show signs of infection it was stable so we only did a small debridement of the surface irrigated with saline and then we placed the collagen membrane and waited for four months so in this case we did not have a total failure you can see that we've gained more than uh, 10 millimeters of bone in some areas and this is the um, the aspect when we reopen uh, for uh, the implant placement. The bone is hard, uh, it's bleeding, and uh, when drilling, we feel some resistance. And it, this is the final situation, the implant in place. Uh, just to, to show you that uh, when peri-implantitis lesions progress, um, to such a severe situation, treatment can be complex and can take some time. Uh, let me uh, talk uh, very briefly about uh, soft tissue augmentation, only three slides. Uh, um, Implant survival, uh, it's not different between implants placed in, in keratinized mucosa versus implants placed in non keratinized um, mucosa. But we also know from the literature that in places where we don't have keratinized tissue, there is an increased plaque retention. Pa patients present more plaque at that areas because sometimes when they brush, they feel some pain and some discomfort. Um, and this study from Alberto Monri is very interesting. Uh, he found that 50% uh, of the implants with peri-implantitis present a lack of uh, keratinized mucosa. And we also know from recent studies, for example, for, from Thomas Linkovicius, that the soft tissue thickness is very important in maintaining a marginal uh, bone level over the time. The best way, the most predictable treatment to increase uh, keratinized tissue is the free gingival graft, the old free gingival graft. You can all also use some human or animal substitutes, but there is nothing equal to autologous uh, uh, material, okay? Uh, we have seen before that uh, uh, connective tissue grafts can uh, be used in some situations uh, <clears throat> to replace uh, collagen membranes. Um, increasing soft tissue thickness and increasing keratinized tissue 
it's, only, uh, it's also important from a surgical point of view. It's more easy to make the incisions, to elevate the flap, to suture. So when we have uh, bad quality and uh, tissues that are in very, very bad shape, sometimes we have to do a soft tissue uh, augmentation first and then uh, after some time, we perform the augmentative surgery. And um, the soft tissue augmentation, it's also important to reduce aesthetic complications as you can see in this case. Uh, this patient presented this abscess uh, with a duration of three months. We perform non-surgical treatments, but the, the situation uh, maintained. Uh, you can see that there is a, here a collapse. We have a, a here a, a collapse on the vestibular palatal uh, direction. In this case, we elevate the flap, uh, clean very well. You can see that we don't have a great amount of bone loss. In this case, we harvested um, a, a graft from the tuberosity. We remove the epithelium. We divide the graft at the middle and we get the double size. And this is the final result. As you can see, tissues now are healthy. We don't have bleeding. We don't have separation. We have a very, very small recession here. But in this case, if we hadn't placed a, a, a connective tissue graft, the recession would be much greater. So, to finish, um, um, this in algorithm for peri-implant disease management. In sometimes, uh, for a, it is it's a joke, but sometimes uh, I say that the this algorithm uh, starts with a question: Who placed the implant? Me or other guy? Uh, I'm joking, but uh, uh, normally we tend to be more conservative when the implant was placed by ourselves. But the first step that we have to evaluate is the mobility of the implant. If the implant has some mobility, we have to see if it's only a screw loosening or if it's the fixture, the implant that is moving. If the implant itself has mobility, it has to be removed and then we can, we can try to regenerate and replace uh, the implant again. Uh, if we don't have mobility, we have to assess the amount of bone loss. We can have mild, moderate, or severe bone loss. In, ca in cases of mild bone loss, we probably will have success only with non-surgical treatment. But in cases of more advanced bone loss, we will have to perform surgery. And then we have to assess the anatomy of the bone, uh, the anatomy of the defect. If we have a, uh, an horizontal bone loss, it's impossible to regenerate, and we go to uh, resective surgery, access surgery. Um, in case of intrabony defects, we can try to do a GBR. Finally, we must assess the quality and thickness of soft tissues. If we have a, a keratinized mucosa of two millimeters or more, we are fine. And then we only need to assess the thickness. If the thickness is more than two millimeters, we don't need any uh, soft tissue graft. So conclusions. Um, the treatment of peri-implantitis, uh, unlike periodontitis, is uh, somewhat unpredictable. So we have to think very, very well before extract a tooth. Okay? Uh, in mild cases, as I told you, non-surgical treatment will work, but in uh, more advanced cases, we will need a surgery to have proper access to the implant to do the decontamination. We shouldn't, we shouldn't delay this treatment. 
because as the amount of bone loss increases, the prognosis, the prognosis also gets worse. And um, Rios integration is possible, but it's not predictable. The anatomy of bone defects uh, and configuration, it's the, the major factor that dictates the outcome of surgical regenerative treatments. We cannot rec recommend you a single um, protocol for implant decontamination. And about soft tissue augmentation, uh, we still need more studies, but um, I think that uh, we are near the consensus that it is important to have keratinized tissue and adequate soft tissue thickness around the implants. But really the best form of, the, of prevention, uh, uh, sorry, the best form of, of treatment uh, is prevention. So patient selection is very important. In my opinion, implants are not for every, every patient, okay? And we must uh, work uh, with the patient, uh, oral hygiene, we must control the systemic risk factors uh, before uh, placing implants. Uh, once uh, we detect uh, perimplantitis, uh, we must treat it without delay uh, to avoid uh, more serious consequences. So thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to be here you, uh, with you today. This is my email. If you have any questions, if you want to make a visit to Portugal, uh, we will be delighted to welcome you. And now I think that we have some time for q and A. I I don't know if you are all sleeping now, but let's see if we have uh, uh, any questions? So I guess for right now, um, there is no questions for right now. And please, if you guys have questions, um, as Dr. Alves said, you can email to him or um, you can email to us. And can you stop sharing your screen, Dr. Arbus, so I can share yes. my screen? Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the lecture, Dr. Alves. And we are very happy to take your opinion on today's webinar. Please share a minute for us. There will be an extra popped up screen um, with only five questions. Thank you very much for your participation. And as you see, we'll always try the best to improve the quality of webinar for your satisfaction. This lecture will be uploaded a week later on our website with YouTube video. So you can watch again this lecture later at any time. Please stay connected with Neobiotech social media to communicate with us more. Search Neobiotech in Facebook and YouTube, then do like, subscribe to get more information. For the next upcoming webinar, it will be on 16th September next Wednesday. Please check your time zone for local areas. Dr. Sale Park from USA will give the, give the lecture. The title is Why Varo in English. He will introduce innovative new concept of surgical guide system for twice. Once again, if you have any questions or information needed, please contact us by email address. And do not forget that you can get more information in our, in our website and social network service. Thank you for attending our webinar. We hope all of you enjoyed this time. Please have a good day or a good night. See all of you again sooner. And I'll
I'll leave this page open for you to finish the survey for about two or three minutes. 